Thank you guys for leading us this morning. Thank you, Billy, for ministering as well. Praise God. We hope you are well at home. We hope you are warm and, and safe. Uh, it's a little bit chilly in the building here, but uh, hopefully we'll warm up as the, as the fire of God comes. Keep me in prayer. Praise God. Now, as you know, at the beginning of each year, we like to have a week of prayer just to rededicate our plans back to God. And not only is this a good practice to get into, but it also helps us to refocus and recalibrate our lives under God. And I, for one, am so glad that we do. Because in prayer, we are able to boldly approach the throne of grace. And we are able to cast all of our burdens onto the Lord, knowing that He cares for us. Another thing that I love about prayer is that we don't have to pray at a set time or a set day of the week. And neither do we have to pray in a consecrated place or assume a certain position, but we can pray wherever and whenever. We can pray either sitting down or standing up. We can pray either walking or driving, and we can pray at either great volume and zeal or quietly and reflectively. It really doesn't matter, just as long as we are communing and connecting with our loving Heavenly Father. Amen. And as we connect with the Father, things are set into motion. As Spurgeon so wonderfully put it, he said, prayer is the slender nerve that moves the arm of omnipotence. Hallelujah. And so, having said that, we're going to continue on our series in the book of Ephesians. And this morning, we're going to unpack very briefly Paul's first prayer. And so, if you have your Bible with you, please come with me to the book of Ephesians. And we're going to read from chapter 1. And verses 15 to 23, and it says this. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Praise God. May the Lord bless the reading and the preaching of his word. Amen. Now, as Paul writes to the Ephesian church, we note that after giving a brief introduction, he breaks out into praise because of what has been accomplished in Christ. And this is classic Pauline theology because all of the Old Testament shadows and types all culminate and crescendo in the person of Jesus. And this is definitely something to rejoice in and be exuberant about. Amen? In fact, 
chapter 1 and verses 3 to 14 in the Greek, it is just one long sentence. It seems that Paul's heart is so bubbling over with praise that he just forgets, he just heaps up word after word, so much so that he forgets to punctuate his sentence with a comma or a full stop. In other words, from the abundance of his heart, his mouth speaks, or should I say, his pen writes. Amen. The year is 62 AD. And at this point in the Roman culture, it was steeped in paganism and idolatry. And more specifically, in Ephesus, it was the cult worship of the goddess Artemis or Diana. However, in a culture of idolatry, God saves a whole bunch of pagans through the preaching of his word. And after seeing many souls come to faith, Paul begins to write to them in order to encourage them. And he begins with, Because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and because I have heard of your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Wow. Paul had heard of their faith. He had heard of their love and their loyalty. And it was a clear sign that God was doing some amazing work among them, saving and transforming lives. Isn't that powerful? And so if God is doing that back then, then he can certainly do that in our day and age today in some of our most gospel-hardened communities. Amen. So there is hope. Hallelujah. Now, like many others, I love to hear Paul preach the wonderful doctrines that we have come to know and love. But more than hear him preach, I love to hear Paul pray. Because it is just so deep and it is just so glorious. It really is. And one thing that we must remember is when Paul is praying for the Ephesian church, he is not sitting on a retreat somewhere with an epic view of a mountain range before him. And neither is he sitting on a beach somewhere sipping on a mocktail. But rather, he is sitting in a Roman prison cell. And it is there that he pens this glorious prayer. Now it is clear that while Paul is sitting in this prison cell, he's not living his best life by no means. And I'm sure that he would have prayed for his release, praying in the same vein as the psalm, saying, How long, O Lord, and why, O God? Because after all, he is human. True? However, in the midst of hardship, it suddenly dawns on him that even though he is sitting in a prison cell, however, his true location is somehow in the heavenlies, in God and in Christ. And so, with the knowledge of that truth burning within him and knowing that there is nothing that could ever separate him from the love of God, he begins to pray for the saints and I pray this morning that we will receive it for ourselves, church. Amen. Now, the burden on the apostles' heart for the Ephesian church and for us is for us to simply to know. Verse 18, that you may know. And what Paul wants us to really get a hold of is to know the benefits of of knowing God. Not just hypothetically and intellectually, but to really know God personally, intimately, and experientially. 
But before we can know this God, a couple of things are necessary. And it's these very things that the apostle prays for. And they are that God will give us a spirit of wisdom and of revelation. And secondly, that he may open the eyes of our heart, as it were, as we have just been singing. In other words, for us to really know God, God must remove the veil from our eyes and he must open us up to himself. And so it is a double work of grace. May God today give us a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Amen. Now, the word for revelation here, it's the Greek term apocalypsis, from which we get the English term apocalypse from. And as I mentioned a few weeks ago, Hollywood have absolutely butchered this term to insinuate something along the lines of, it's the end of the world type stuff. But to the Jews in the first century, this term indicated an unveiling or a revealing of something. It was in the sense of pulling back the curtain or lifting off the cover or the lid to something to show us more. And we say this morning, yes, Lord, pull back the curtain because we want to see you more clearly and we want to know you more intimately. That we don't want to just know a whole bunch of facts about God or know a whole bunch of theology and doctrine, as important as it is. But we want to know God himself. And like Paul, we want to be sold out for Jesus. Don't we, church? Amen. You see, if you are watching online or if you are here as well this morning, and if you believe that there is a creator who spoke everything into existence, and if you believe that God sent his son into the world, not to condemn it, but that the world may be saved through him, and if you believe in the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, then know that you did not arrive at that conclusion by yourself. But it was because God opened the eyes of your heart and he gave you an apocalypse to behold his glory. Hallelujah. And so it is entirely a work of God. Amen. Which is why the hymn writer John Newton could pen his popular hymn of amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. We see because Jesus has opened the eyes of our heart and he has given us a revelation of himself. Can somebody shout or type, amen. Praise him. So Paul is praying that our eyes will be enlightened, that we may know three things. Firstly, that we may know the hope to which he has called us. Praise God. Now, there's a difference between worldly hope and biblical hope. As worldly hope is more along the lines of wishful thinking, in the sense of, I hope I get that dream job, or I hope to get super buff and beach ready in time for the summer. And that may or may not happen. But on the other hand, biblical hope is future certainty, and we can stake our very life upon it. 
because the one who gives life has already paved the way when he rose from the grave. And one day he is going to return and he is going to restore all things in a new heaven and a new earth and with a new humanity. And he is going to take all of our mountaintop experiences as well as our moments in the valley and he's going to turn them around for our good and for his glory. Therefore, the hope of our calling is that what God has begun in us, he will bring to completion in Christ. And so let us cling to the hope of our call. Amen. Secondly, Paul prays that we will know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Wow. Now, far above the planets, the stars, and the constellations, God has chosen us for himself to be his prized possession and his inheritance. And what Paul wants us to know is that God has invested everything in his inheritance so that we may shine with the riches of his glory. And his riches, they are inexhaustible and beyond all compare. And because that's the case, we have everything at our disposal to live and be the people of God on this earth, which is why Paul, sitting in a soul-crushing prison cell, is still able to hold his peace and keep his joy because he knows how to abound and he knows how to be abased because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Philippians 4. Praise be to his name. Amen. He's given us everything, church. He has given us every bit of strength, of grace. It is more than sufficient for us to succeed in this victorious Christian life in Jesus. Hallelujah. The third and the final thing that Paul prays for is that we may know the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. Now, when we look at this section, we note that Paul uses a number of Greek words in order to convey the notion of his all-surpassing power. I mean... He uses words like dunamis, from which we get the term dynamite from, because it's explosive power. Then he also uses a word of energia, which means energy and active energy at that, not just passive or potential energy. Then he uses the word kratos, which means um, rule or might. And it's used in our English words such as democracy or theocracy, meaning either the rule of the people or the rule of God. And so what Paul wants us to know is the vast panorama of God's great power that is at work towards us. That it's only in him that we have the victory over devils and demons and even over our own flesh. What's more is that it's this power, it's his power that puts demons to flight and gives the child of God a song in the night, as it were. And if you want an example of what this power actually looks like, then Paul says, Look no further than the Christ. Because the very same power that raised Jesus from the dead 
is the same power that is at work among the saints this morning. And so, let us look to the one who is seated on the throne and let us know that he is with us and he is for us. And if he can be with us, then who can stand against us? So let's draw hope from knowing this God. Amen. Now, last year in our Seven at Seven meetings, I shared a number of devotionals on the topic of knowing God. It's essentially the sum total of my life to know Him and to make Him known. You see, I don't want to just read a whole bunch of books about a person who knew a person, who then knew a person, who then somehow knew God. No. But I want to personally, intimately, and experientially know God more than I have ever known Him before. That's my prayer for not only this year, but for every year of my life. And so I join with the Apostle Paul and I give a wholehearted amen. Can you and will you do the same this morning, church? Amen. You see, it was God who made the first move. God was the one who stooped down low and he lifted us up and he has seated us today in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And our life is secure in him that neither death can ever separate a believer from the Lord. Hallelujah. And so if you're watching online this morning, And if you do not know this Jesus that we have been singing and speaking of and would like to, then please, right now, just hit the live prayer button and our online hosts will assist you. Or why not drop us a note, send us an email, and we would love to connect with you. So do get in touch. Because you also can have and you can know this blessed assurance and this security that neither death nor life nor angel nor demon, nothing present nor things to come will ever be able to separate us from this loving Lord of glory. Praise God. Amen. I'm going to invite the band just to come back up and get ready to lead us. But this Jesus is the one that has saved us, that has known us from before we were even knitted together in our mother's womb. And it is this Jesus who has called us, set us apart and unto him. And for those of us who know this loving Lord of glory, let us echo the Apostles' Prayer, that God may give us a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him that we may go deep this year and that we may know Him and that we may know the hope of our calling the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints. And may we not only know, but may we walk in the immeasurable greatness of his power. Or if you like, may we walk in resurrection power. Hallelujah. And so, as we, as the team lead us in this song set to music, let us make it our prayer this morning. And let us pray, God, will you open the eyes of my heart because I want to see you. I want to know you more than I have ever known you before. I don't want to hear about you, Lord God, but I want to know you personally and intimately, Lord God, more than I have ever known you before. 
And not only do I want to know you, Father, but I want to make you known in this world for your glory. In Jesus' name, as we sing, let's make it our prayer and let's give that to God.